Hello, um, I'm Chris Copson. I'm a researcher here at the Tank Museum. And these are my top five tanks. They're not necessarily the, you know, the biggest or the toughest or the heaviest or anything like that. This is very much a personal choice and I hope you enjoy it. So let's get started. Please remember to like, subscribe, or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. Now, I know this is supposed to be my top five tanks. This little contraption isn't really a tank at all. It's got tracks, it's got armor, but it's actually a carrier. It's the Carden Lloyd carrier. It's also, they're sometimes known as tankettes. Um, now these, for the most part, lots of countries had them. Uh, we had the Carden Lloyd later on during World War II, the universal carrier, the thing that's sometimes wrongly called the Bren carrier. Um, the French had the Chenillette. Uh, the Italians had the Caro Velucci, which is a nasty little um, sort of flamethrower contraption. Um, but what this is all about, and why this is important to me, is it's evocative of a particular period in the development of armoured warfare and combined operations. <clears throat> um, now the Carden Lloyd, as you can see, it's a very small vehicle, crew of two. Um, it's actually got the engine from a Model T Ford car. Uh, it's armament, you've got a Vickers gun there, um, mounted on the vehicle to start with, and there's a tripod here, so if you want to dismount it and use it independently, you can do that. Um, from the War Department perspective, the other attractive thing about it is it only cost 400 quid. So it's cheap, you can get quite a few of these things. Um, it's very rudimentary. I mean, if you sit inside, um, your head and shoulders actually protrude above the fairly meagre armour plate. They were designed as vehicles for infantry support. They ended up being used, quite a lot of them, by the Royal Tank Regiment in a reconnaissance role. Now, what this is all about is something, a development of the British Army in the late 20s, early 30s, called the EMF, the Experimental Mechanised Force. Now, this is a period when you have quite a few, you know, very forward-thinking individuals um, in circulation. And I'm thinking of Major General J.F.C. Fuller, Boney Fuller, uh, Basil Little Hart. Um, I mean, guys like this... Um, Martel, uh, who was in charge of the experimental uh, bridging school. Um, they are really sort of theorising about the future of armoured warfare. And what it's all about is effectively mechanisation, getting everything on wheels or tracks. So you have fast-moving, hard-hitting armoured columns. And the number of vehicles available is, is fairly immense. I mean, we have carriers. We have got uh, light and medium tanks. Uh, we've got the birch gun, self-propelled artillery. Uh, we have armoured and soft-skinned troop transports. Uh, we've got the dragon tractor, which is used as uh, an artillery prime mover. So, I mean, when you look at it, we've got a picture here of the EMF drawn up in review order. And this is 1927, and you look at it and you think, that is amazingly modern. That looks like my definition of a battle group. And they put this to the test in some really sort of uh, large-scale manoeuvres. 1927, the Eastland versus Westland exercises. Uh, if you want to look it up, um, Google the Battle of Beresford Bridge. This is all about armoured warfare plus um, air cooperation as well, because the RAF um, are in there assisting uh, in what's going on. Um, the problem is that... This runs on for a few years, but there are some pretty hidebound characters in the general staff, and eventually the idea is more or less binned. But it doesn't stop there, because there are foreign observers. We have a photograph of Werner von Blomberg, um, who has um, popped over with some of his staff to uh, come and take a look at what we're up to. And of course, the apostle of armoured warfare is Heinz Guderian. 
schneller Heinz. Um, I mean, he's watching what we're up to. Um, the German general staff are very, very interested. Uh, they're also picking up um, on the Russian techniques of deep battle at the time. Sorry, I should have said Soviet, not Russian. Um, they put those together, they synthesize it, and they come up with Vornungskrieg, maneuver warfare. They, one of those things I'm nitpicking here, they didn't call it Blitzkrieg. That comes a little bit later on. But what it does just go to show is the likes of Little Heart, Fuller, et al. Um, they are pioneering some work here with little vehicles like this that really does cast a long shadow. It sets the scene for armoured warfare in the future, well into World War II and beyond. This tank, the Shabi Umbis, this is one I've got a, a particular affection for. Um, it's an extraordinary beast, it really is. I mean, you look at her and you think, that's a World War I tank. Well, no, actually, dating from the 1930s, it's a World War II tank. But it's got very much a World War I look about it. The other thing you think is, it's a beast. Bristling with guns, uh, massively heavily armoured. And you look at something like the little German Panzer II over there, and you think, how did these guys ever lose? But this is obviously, it's a French tank um, and it dates or it was in use um, in places all the way through World War II, in fact, under different ownership. Come to that in a moment. Um, the tank itself, as I said, it's huge. You've got a 75 millimeter gun in the hull. The secondary armament is a 47 millimeter gun in the turret itself. Um, we start to run into one or two problems here, <coughs> though, because the 75 um, has got no traverse. So the only way you could aim and fire it is to point the tank at something. So the job of the driver who sits here is to aim and fire the 75 as well as to obviously drive the tank. Um, now the whole thing about this, <coughs> he's got quite a lot to do. Um, that gun, because there's no traverse, there's no way you can really engage a moving target with that. So it's what we call a bunker buster. So in tank-on-tank -tank combat, you're down to the 47mm gun in the turret. Now the problem here is that is a one-man turret. So the poor old commander is massively overworked. He has to aim, load and fire that gun and also acquire targets, sight up. Um, and the only way really to do that, I can imagine the poor guy opening the hatch at the back of the turret, sitting out on it with his binoculars, looking for a target, ducking back in, loading the gun, and then the target tank, he'd see, oh, where's that gone? So there's a couple of the sort of problems there, really. Um, but it is a hulking great thing, and it could take a huge amount of damage. Um, the reason I'm really sort of into this one is I've spent quite a lot of time on a battlefield, a place called Flavion, down towards the Ardennes. And this is all about, this is the story of 1940. Bit of background. Um, so um, the story we were always told is the French had built the Maginot Line. They were going to sit behind it. They weren't interested in armed warfare. That is absolutely rubbish. The Maginot Line is designed to stop uh, incursions from Germany into France, and it runs up to the border with Belgium. But the French army, in fact, was moving steadily, you know, towards the modern use of armour. They are forming units called DLMs, Divisions Légères Mécaniques, light, uh, light armoured divisions, and especially DCRs, Division Cuirassé de Réserve, and that's an armoured division equipped with things like this. Um, what happens in 1940, they're not really quite got far enough down the road. And at Flavion, the um, premier DCR, the first French armoured division, encounters 7th and 10th Panzer divisions. Um, the problem is that it's an armoured division equipped with really rather good tanks like this. This probably isn't the best tank that the French were fielding. They've got the Sommure, which is a cracking little medium tank as well. But their logistics, their G4, 
is not that great. They're relying on things like tracked fuel tankers to actually try and keep these very thirsty beasts fueled up and mobile. And at Flavion, um, the tanks there of the first DCR are more or less out of fuel. They're sitting ducks. Seventh and 10th pounds are used there. Mobility uh, above anything, lighter, faster tanks. And they effectively destroy uh, the first French armored division, which is one of the premier assets of the French army in 1940. Um, these things do, though well um, commanded, these things are actually capable of doing great things. It's quite a famous story, but a place called Stoner, uh, Captain Pierre Bilot took his Char B into an engagement with German armor and knocked out two Panzer IVs, 11 Panzer threes, and took out two pieces of artillery as well. His tank was hit 140 times to very little effect, and it still went home under its own steam. So Pierre Villot, he's a very good tank commander. In fact, he's a much better tank commander than his dad was a general, if the story is, uh, is, is, is told, um, but we haven't got time to go into that now. The Char B has got one real Achilles heel, and that's round this side, there is a louvered fitting. That is the radiator. It's sat there on the uh, side of the tank. It's quite a large target. If you put a round into that, the whole thing stops. However, our Char B, interesting history, uh, was captured by the German army in 1940. Somewhat improved, so we've got extra armour, basically boxes full of concrete added to the front. Uh, we've also got um, a radio aerial mount. We've got a jack. These were things that all uh, added by the German army. And then the tank itself was sent to the Channel Islands as, um, I suppose it was almost like a sort of static pillbox over there. Um, I think the German army are also responsible for the peculiar finish on the turret, the upper works. It almost looks like tar or bitumen or something of that sort. And I do wonder whether that's um, designed to proof the tank against the sea air of you know, the coast of Jersey or Guernsey. When the Channel Islands are retaken, the British army um, liberate this tank and she's taken back to the UK for evaluation. And the part, final part of her history is that painted on that side, you can just see the word Long Cross. And Long Cross, um, Chertsey, was the military vehicle experimental establishment where this vehicle was taken for evaluation post-1945. So this tank is uh, the Chieftain British Army main battle tank. This is a bit of a personal one for me because I remember um, back in the 1980s seeing these things in Germany and on Salisbury Plain, places like that were on exercise and being massively impressed by the sheer sort of um, uh, bulk and noise and everything else that comes with a main battle tank. Um, now the Chieftain is a very long serving tank. Um, started off with the British Army in 1963, I think, went right the way through to the late 90s. So it's a true Cold War vehicle. And it went through quite a few evolutions. I think we're up to about Mark 12 or Mark 13. Um, so the Chieftain changes during the course of its service. This embodies really what is the British Army's um, ideas on what a main battle tank needs to be able to do, which is to knock out the enemy and absorb punishment. So we have got a very heavy, thickly armoured tank, and we've got a massive 120 millimetre tank gun. That at the time, that's the most powerful tank gun in the world. This is at variance to what other people are doing, the likes of um, the West German army. Leopard is a lot more, a, more, a lot lighter, a lot more mobile. Um, the French AMX is the same, but the British army is really favouring firepower and protection over mobility. Now the mobility thing is probably just as well because the engine in the back of this tank was legendarily awful. This is the British Leyland L60 multi-fuel. 
Now, Leyland, Leyland Motors, British Leyland, if you ask most Brits about that, um, you'll get a wry expression and memories of some of the cars they built. Uh, things like the Austin Allegro and the Morris Marina. And these are dreadful, dreadful cars. And I'm afraid um, a lot of that, possibly not the design, but certainly the build quality, goes into this uh, diesel engine. Um, the thing itself, when you take it out, it's, I mean, it's got advantages. It's not just an engine, it's a power pack. So you've got the engine plus the cooling systems, everything like that, in a big block. So you can put a crane in, lift it out of the back of the tank, and stick another one in. The bad news is you'll probably have to do that quite often because they had massive problems, uh, oil leaks, general sort of debilitation. Chieftain was a tank that broke down even more than most tanks. And that's actually saying something if you know about tanks. Although a friend of mine who spent a substantial part of his career on Chieftain said that as long as the tank was worked and worked hard, it was fine. The engine just needed to be kept warm, kept running. If you put the tank in a tank shed and leave it there for three or four months, you are in for um, a world of pain and grief. But if the tank is run constantly, then um, not so many problems by a long chalk. Anyway, as I said, this is a tank that um, effectively saw the British Army through a substantial part of the Cold War, served in British Army of the Rhine and in various other places. <clears throat> um, the other thing I would just like to sort of mention in connection with this tank um, is something that is the bane of the life of any tank man. This is called track bashing. Now, a lot of people don't understand the fact that tracks wear appallingly badly and quickly. So you've got track links, cast steel, and then you've got the track pins that actually run through to join them together. Those little holes in the pins themselves where the tracks generally stretch, um, and it is pure abrasion. And eventually, you can't uh, adjust them out anymore. You actually have to um, take effectively you just sort of take, wind, wind the adjuster down and actually take a link out because the track has worn that badly. Um, if you ever come here you can see uh, the degree of abrasion on this tank, not on the tracks but actually on the sprocket wheels at the back. Now another thing that a lot of people don't understand is that not all the wheels of the tank are powered. In fact there's only one set generally which is um, powered which is attached to the engine via the final drive. Those are the sprockets, those are the toothed wheels. Sometimes at the front, sometimes at the back. But if you look at the sprocket wheels on this one, there's one new sprocket, which has got nice square teeth, and there's one old sprocket, and the teeth are worn down uh, to a frazzle. They're very, very pointed. So that's Chieftain. Um, if you had problems, but this is a tank that I've seen on exercise always been impressed with one of my favorites so next up is this this is a very very rare beast indeed this is the last surviving intact Sherman DD Sherman duplex drive tank um, now a little bit about the Sherman to start with a lot of people rubbish the Sherman uh, I don't I mean the Sherman M4 1942, that is the best medium tank in the world, arguably. And it is a tank that's capable of mass production. Um, it's capable of evolution. I mean, it's being produced at a number of different plants. So some have cast hulls, some have welded hulls. Um, you've got some composite ones. It's capable of up gunning. So if it goes from a 75 millimeter gun to a high velocity 76. Um, and it's got a number of different engines because they couldn't find i mean the numbers you're talking about with sherman are huge fifty thousand tanks they couldn't fit the same engine to each so there's half a dozen different engines put in these things including some quite odd ones like the multi-bank um and a radial engine so that's the sherman um i know it's not as big and tough as some of the later german tanks but certainly in the early part of the war, it's more than capable of taking care of Panzer 1, 2, 3, 4. 
you get problems when it comes to the likes of tiger and panther. However, what this is all about is D-Day, Operation Overlord, the Allied invasion of Europe. And what we are doing here is to kick in the front door of Festung Europa, uh, Fortress Europe, the West Wall. This is going to be a massive undertaking. In fact, if any of you guys, if you've not been to Normandy, you really need to go. Because only when you get there, you appreciate the scale of the operation. If you land at Ouistreham, Port de Con, um, that's the eastern end of the landing beaches, and you drive down to the other end, down to Pointe du Hoc in the west, takes you just in your car, just driving down the road. It's a couple of hours. This is a massive, massive undertaking. Now, this was going to be tough and bloody because the Wehrmacht and the Kriegsmarine had had four years to prepare for what they knew was coming. So as you go down that coast, you see countless gun positions, artillery batteries, pillboxes, Tobruks, things like that. The whole coast is absolutely crammed with defensive assets. So, when you think about this, landing on an enemy-occupied beach is going to be the most difficult and dangerous thing you can do. I mean, you've probably all seen Saving Private Ryan. Now, most of that film, is a, the story is a bit of a fairy tale, but that first 22 minutes, that's an accurate depiction of what it was like uh, landing on a hostile beach like Omaha. Now, if you can get armour onto the beach at an early stage, it's going to save you a world of grief and pain. And that's exactly what we have here. So, enter stage left, um, a slightly eccentric um, but brilliant inventor, a, a guy called Nicholas Straussler. He is Hungarian, and he figures out how to make 28 tons of metal, a Sherman tank, float. What you do is you put a screen around it. This massively increases the displacement of the tank. It's like sort of hanging underneath a boat, effectively. It's braced on the inside with scaffold and inflatable tubing. The crew actually have to stand on top. They brace themselves against it. Because when you launch this into the sea, it's a very, very dangerous undertaking in itself. Because if you get a wave over the top of that, 28 tons of metal sinks very rapidly indeed. And unfortunately, that's what happened to quite a lot of the American tanks in particular. They were launched too far out, the current took them, they broached and they sank. But those that got ashore did very good work. Now, if you think about the approaches to D-Day, you're a German gunner, you're on your cliff top, you are the ultimate target-rich environment down there. You have got LCIs and LCTs coming in. Higgins boats, destroyers dashing them out, lots of things to shoot at. If you think about this when it's in the water, it looks like a little brown boat. You can almost ignore it until it hits, grounds, the crew fire the explosive bolts to drop the screen, and that German gunner is turning around to his mate saying, hang on, there's a tank down there, just as an HE round comes in through the slit of his pillbox. So as I say, getting armour onto the beach at an early stage, and the British Army in particular, 79th Armoured, there's a whole range of different weird contraptions to make that job easier. That is the Sherman DD. Oh, the DD bit, should have mentioned this earlier, at the back, it's not just a boat, it's got propellers. They operate off the main drive, so this is a contraption that not only floats, it swims comes onto the beach, does its job. We are incredibly proud to have the last original surviving intact Sherman DD in this museum. Being a First World War historian, this British Mark IV had to be my number one tank every time. Um, it is a tank that was built in 1917, more of these were built than any other 
type of tank in the First World War, 1,200 of the things. And also, there's something slightly peculiar about this, more British tank crew and more German tank crew went to war in the Mark IV than any other type of vehicle. I'll come to that a bit later. But first of all, what is it about these tanks? I mean, I've spent an awful lot of time on the First World Battlefield, places like the Somme and Combray, and these are just really compelling machines. They really are totally revolutionary for their time. Um, now, in our terms, this isn't really a tank. It's not a high mobility weapon. Um, it is, I, I tend to say, it's, it's almost a bit more like a medieval siege tower than anything. Because this is a slow moving machine. Um, on the road, it can manage four miles an hour. Off road, probably about two. And what it's got to do is plod the few hundred meters across no man's land, flatten the wire, knock out the machine guns, and let the infantry through behind. Um, in terms of um, the operation of the vehicle, it's pretty horrific for the crew as well, because you've got a crew of eight. Um, now, this is a male, so she's got six pounder guns, or should I say he, has got six pounder guns either side. Um, the females have machine guns. So that takes care of four of eight crew. They are gunners, and they occupy the sponsons either side of the thing. But where are the other four? Well, you've got the commander and the driver up at the front, but they can basically they can put the brakes on and they make, make the thing go forward. That's about all. They can't steer. Steering is down to the remaining two crew members at the back, um, the gearsmen, and they can off the power to one track at a time so the tank can actually be steered. So what you've got, just to recap there, is <clears throat> a vehicle that is steered by a committee of four. I have enough friends who have problems with a single steering wheel in their motor car. This is actually a nightmare. And inside, the conditions are horrific. It is um, incredibly hot. It, the air is full of carbon monoxide, cordite smoke, oil sprays everywhere. The tank pitches about, you get burned on the engine, uh, knocked out. I mean, they are, health and safety would run right on these things. They're an appalling environment to go to war in. But these guys still did. They were incredibly tough, incredibly brave, and they wanted to do their job. Now, the other thing about this one, the Mark IV, this is the tank of Combray. And Combray, if anybody knows anything about the Royal Tank Regiment, um, Combray is the first effectively big tank attack. Um, and it takes place in November 1917. By that time, we've got these things on Western Front in numbers. And it's an attack by 420 odd tanks. But there are other things brought in. It's um, combined operations. So we have tanks. We have an artillery fire plan. We've got infantry trained to operate the tanks and aircraft trained to cooperate by strafing, bombing, carrying out reconnaissance. So it's the, it's the first time really where all these elements of modern warfare come together. And the Mark IV is right in the middle. Um, the tank itself, you know, had major problems. Um, it's not exactly an untried weapon system, but it's unreliable, and it was prone to um, come a cropper on the battlefield. So uh, we have things to assist us. And a lot of these were actually created by the tank corps, invented by tank men. Up on the top there, that's a fascie. It's a big bundle of logs, mostly put together by the Chinese Labour Corps, in fact. And the idea is that you drop that into a trench to help you get across because this will cross a gap up to about three metres wide. Any wider, she'll fall in. The other thing are unditching beams that help you get through um, mud. I mean, as I say, a lot of these are inventions of the tank men themselves. So they are brave, tough, and also resourceful. Now, Combray is a massive success in some ways. We knock a hole in the Hindenburg line, toughest bit of the German front line, which is six miles wide and four miles deep. It doesn't go well after that, but um, I won't go into that now. Um, but the whole thing about it is that an awful lot of tanks are left abandoned on the battlefield. And some of them are recovered by the enemy, by the German army. And they rearm them 
uh, mend them, refuel them, and then send them back against us. Now, you know I mentioned that more German and British tank crew went to war in these vehicles than any other. That is because of Combray. The German army built a tank, the A7V, the Sturmpanzer. It wasn't really good. They didn't build many, 20 odd. But there are getting on for a hundred, what they call Beuter Panzer, um, captured tanks. Uh, captured by the German army and used back against the British army. So as I said, this is a remarkable vehicle. More British and more German tank crew go to war in a Mark IV than any other. So that's my top five tanks. Um, I hope you enjoyed the choice. If you can, please subscribe uh, to our YouTube channel or support us on Patreon.